Hey, what's up, YouTube? This is International Master David Proust, and we've got some more highlights for you today from the Shanklin Hess death match. These segments all come from blitz games played by Grandmasters Robert Hess and Sam Shanklin during a three hour cash match on chess.com. And so remember and keep in mind that this is all from blitz games. Now, in previous death matches, we've seen some really good games at times, but it was usually, you know, well played openings and middle games. And something that was really quite shocking to me, genuinely, about this match, you know, as somebody who thought about it a lot before it happened and, you know, prepared for the broadcast and has seen both of these players play, something that really shocked me was how many great end games and great end game concepts we had in this match. So that's what I chose to feature here in these YouTube videos. And if you've already seen the previous video about Hess's tactics, those were quite impressive. What I'm going to show you, though, is that Shanklin had his own endgame moments, which were really, really incredible. And in fact, in the end, in an extremely close match, Shanklin prevailed by three games after winning the last two. So with three minutes left in a three-hour match, he was only ahead by one game. He won the last two games to clinch the match and uh, most of the $1,000 prize. And his endgame play was actually incredible. He didn't play these kind of precise tactical sequences that we saw from Hess. But what Shanklin was able to do was he was able from an early point in the game to predict that certain equal material endgames would be winning for him. Okay, And I'm going to show you, like with Hess, three examples of this. And it's really just uncanny and amazing. So here we are. We've got a position where Shanklin has a knight against a bishop. The situation favors the knight because of white's pawns on these three light squares on the king side, which have been limiting this bishop. And uh, the position is definitely a little bit better for black, uh, maybe a lot better, but it's quite tricky to play. Shanklin had gone towards this position through a bunch of simplifications. He's probably very happy to get here, but that's not a surprise because most strong players would know that this is good for black. But now watch how he converts this game. First, he weakens the light squared diagonal, which surprised me. And then he advanced his king into the center. Now his king controls these penetration points on the D file, which is why Hess abandons the D file with his queen and starts considering penetrating at A7 to try and restrain black's queen and knight from going completely on the offensive. A lot of people would just sink this knight into F4 as soon as possible in this situation, but you see Shanklin doesn't commit the knight too soon at any point. Um, he's still working on improving his king and setting up the situation he wants to win this game. So now he locks down on moves like f4 and h4 with his g-pawn. And Hess, meanwhile, is improving his bishop to this nice open long diagonal. And suddenly Sam's king seems airy and I, you know, watching the game live, I was wondering about his decision to move the f-pawn and open up these light squares. There's a threat here of queen c5 check, but Shanklin just stops that and then switches his queen to the d file, starting to prepare to penetrate into the game. And it turns out that there's no really good defense here for Hess against the idea of just playing queen d3. So Sam actually has everything perfectly set up. His king defending these squares meant that even if Hess had put his queen on d2, Shanklin would have been in a position to move his queen to the d file. He's able to use the pawn on b6 to block the queen out. And uh, meanwhile, knight on f4 supports queen d3. So Hess tries to open up diagonals for his bishop further and chip away at these pawns. Shanklin just plays the tactical queen d3 anyway, and queen b6 cannot be played because of checkmate over here. Very important point. So Hess instead captures on b5, and Shanklin just takes back. There's still no queen b6, still nothing to be done. Um, his threat here, if Hess does nothing, one threat would be to take the queen, but a second threat is to play queen to f1, creeping in and threatening checkmate, which would force Hess's queen into retreat on g3, and then Shanklin could maneuver his way for a victory there. So Hess just traded into this endgame and brings his king, but Shanklin grabs the pawn, right? There's no way to defend both of those pawns 
because he was attacking the F2 pawn as well. Hess brings his king, Sam grabs this pawn, and then uses this pawn on b5 to play the excellent move knight to a4. And this is interesting because way back here, when Hess took on b5, my co-commentator Danny Wrench pointed out that c5 was a move which makes a lot of sense, right? Leaving both pawns on dark squares, letting this pawn block its own bishop, and to try and convert the endgame like this, which made a lot of sense, right? Because you're still going to get the knight to d3, pick up a pawn, then try and slowly win this position by maneuvering with your knight, and white's bishop is hemmed in. But Shanklin correctly knew that he should take this extra doubled isolated pawn over here because he'd be able to use it to play this move knight a4. And incidentally, the tactic c4 by white trying to undermine things would just fail to this knight moving to c5, attacking the bishop on b3. So Hess moved his king over, Shanklin grabbed a second pawn, and now he's got everything under control here. And he just moves his king over to the king side, abandons the queen side. He's going to mop up every single one of these pawns and has resigned. So that was a fantastic example of playing a whole game where you've sort of mapped out that you're able to win a certain end game. And so you're, you're determining your play throughout the middle game based on knowing that you can get to that end game and then win it. And superb technique as well, of course. Now, let's see another example here. Now, this position here is a game where Shanklin is white and Hess is black and Shanklin has what seems like a small advantage because of this pawn on d6. But uh, Sam has had a plan with these pawn moves. He's actually prepared to, at some point, swing his queen to g5. And if he gets queens off the board, then his king won't be loose and he can use possession of the e-file to try and get a better king than Hess, and his king actually has a threatened road for breaking into the game, which would indeed be decisive. So queens are traded, his king comes up, Hess plays rook to e7, Shanklin could stay in a favorable rook ending by playing rook d2, and this pawn would need to be defended, but he's figured out long, long, long ago that he can win this king and pawn ending, and he just trades off the rooks, and brings his king up. So Hess for the moment prevents him from playing king d5 and also prevents him from playing f5, right? Because a nice winning plan here for white would be f5. Let me just show the idea. f5, pawn takes, king takes, king moves, and then you play g6, pawn takes, king takes, and your king has gotten so far forward through those pawn trades that you're able to win this pawn here for free. Okay, so king e6 stops him. But Shanklin has a whole bunch of extra tempi after playing the next move, b4. And now he can move this pawn to a3 or a4 in order to force the black king to cede space to him. So Hess's king moves backwards, Shanklin's king moves forward. And the king moves here, keeping Sam out of c6 for now. Pushes b5. And in this position... He still has two extra moves for his pawn left, so he can always force black to make a move and give way. But already black is forced to make a choice which way to go with the king. Well, if the king went to e7, it would be a short game because the king would come into c6. So Hess moved his king to c7. And now Shanklin swings back around and plays f5. And as I've shown before, black can't take because of king takes f5 and then g6. So Hess plays king to e7, and now Shanklin simply trades and comes back to d5. The point of the trade is he got rid of the pawn on f7 that was covering e6. Hess's king comes back to d7, and Shanklin moves his a pawn. And this is now a Zugzwang. Wherever the black king moves, the white king will penetrate in one direction or the other. Um, so, for example, king c7, Shanklin could now come into e6. The king has to move back. Shanklin will take this pawn. He'll walk over and take this pawn. It's all easy peasy from here. So Hess played his king to e7, and now Shanklin penetrated with his king. And you can see that he is going to queen his a pawn before black is able to queen the h pawn. If you're not sure of that, take a minute or two to count it out for yourself. But this was really, really incredible that, that Shanklin playing into this position had, had understood from so far away that when he would eventually go queen g5 and trade queens that he would be able to win this endgame. 
uh, when we were really unsure how big of an advantage he really had in this middle game. All right, now this one here, I'm going to show you the transition from the middle game to the end game because it itself is really uh, pretty exciting. It seemed during the game that Robert Hess here had created a terrific position as black with some unusual and enterprising endgame play. He's forced Shanklin to recapture on d1 with a bishop instead of a rook because this pawn on a5 seemed to need protection. He has successfully created a terrific square on e5 for a piece of his, and that's the meaning behind this knight move, partly. And his bishops both seem really excellently placed, and this pawn is isolated. What is Shanklin doing here? Well, Shanklin now embarks on some incredible tactics. Apparently, he has been banking concretely on his ability to grab this pawn on a7. Now, Hess responds by trapping the bishop with c5, right, blocking the communication of the queen. And Shanklin plays bishop to b6. Well, the tactical sequence that follows seems to win for Hess. Hess plays knight takes bishop, pawn takes knight. That's a trade so far. Now he grabs a rook, sacking his queen, but after Shanklin takes the queen, he wins Shanklin's queen for a bishop, which means in the resulting endgame, he should have a rook versus a knight after these pieces trade. Now, the bishop is covering the promotion square. is very, very important. And Shanklin can't take on d4 because when the pawn attacks his knight and his knight moves, he'll lose this bishop. So Shanklin just has to meekly move his king, takes, takes, unpinning the bishop now, and the rook comes back to help defend against the c7 pawn. So Shanklin grabbed that pawn on a7, but appeared to walk into a tactic where he lost a rook against a piece, transposing into the endgame. But one immediately realizes that things aren't that clear as Shanklin plays bishop g4, trading the better bishop and helping him fight for this square here, and then the move knight to d5. Now, once Shanklin plays knight d5, he has got a threat, and that's why Hess did not move the king closer to the pawn here, because the threat would be to trade and then move the knight to b6. And now he's attacking the rook, and also he can queen the pawn, but the rook has nowhere to go, really. So it would be completely over once his knight gets to b6 like this. So you see that Shanklin didn't want to take on e6 in general because it would deprive his knight of the best square when a pawn would come to this square. And Hess didn't want to take on g4 because then he could never deal with the knight using his bishop. Okay, so rook comes to c8, stopping this knight b6 move. And Shanklin just starts advancing his king into the center. And now we realize that Hess is in a quandary. If his king moves to d7 to help fight against this pawn, Shanklin can always play the move knight b6 check and capture the rook. He can never take the knight because of bishop taking his rook, right? So let me just show you this scenario here. White's going to be able to move this bishop and then promote the pawn. So this endgame will always be lost for black. So it seems like there's actually nothing for Hess to do here, and Shanklin has successfully predicted that he can lose a rook, go into this endgame, and his knight and pawn will triumph over the rook. Despite his strange and shaky pawn structure, right? This pawn here is isolated and separated from the other pawns. This pawn here is isolated, and he's allowing Hess to trade on g4, giving him two isolated pawns that are doubled over on the g-file. Well, finally, Hess didn't have anything else to really try. I mean, he could have tried this move h5, but then Shanklin would just move his bishop to f5, right? Still refusing to, to ever trade. And the bishop would be secure here on f5, and black would still be locked in. So what Hess finally did was he took on g4, Shanklin took back, and he moved his king over because he had to. Now Shanklin's king tries to get into the game before Hess's king will be able to get there because, as you'll see, even after Hess plays his king up here and knight check, king takes, knight takes, king takes. Even if Hess plays into this, it will be an equal material endgame where Sam has by far the worst pawn structure, so his only hope will be to have the more active king, right? And in fact, if Hess had gone for this, Shanklin would win with king c4, attacking the c-pawn, whereas if Hess's king could play to c6 here in one move, he would have at least a drawn endgame immediately. Maybe even a win, because he would hold Sam's king off, 
and eventually transfer his own king to e5 to attack Sam's isolated pawn. But after king c4, b6, Sam's king would be able to come in very active here, and he would eventually win this position here because his king is so active. So he'll play like e5, and if the king steps this way, he can go here and take these pawns. And if the king goes here, he can play e6 and get his king in this way. So this advanced king position could lead to a win in the equal material king and pawn ending simply because of that king activity. So Hess plays b5 to try and keep Sam's king out. And you see that all these squares are covered by the two black pawns. Very nice. But Sam has found that he can just barely get through here too before the black king is able to get into the game. He plays c3, check, takes that rook, plays b4, Hest took. Another option is to consider sacking the pawn to try to bring the king up. Like this. And now the white king is stuck defending the pawn, and whichever king has to move back first is going to lose. If the white king has to move back, black will take this pawn with a great position. If the black king has to move back, the white king will move forward and then push this pawn and gain space. So Hess can give up a tempo like this, but Shanklin would give up a tempo like this with his poor doubled isolated pawn contributing something. The black king is forced back. Shanklin's king would come up, and you would see him mop up the game like this with his king coming forward far enough. So after b4, Hess took on b4. Sorry, like this. Sam took back. King came up to block Sam's king. But after king to e4, in this equal material position, with Sam having all isolated and doubled and horrible pawns, Hess resigned because Shanklin's king wins the tempo and, and it advances, right? If he comes back... Shanklin's king is going to come into d5, and he's safely going to walk over and eat this pawn on b5. And once he's got the extra outside pass pawn, he'll win. So this is a really fantastic example. I mean, to, to have seen that you can get this kind of an endgame with your king further up the board, and you're going to win equal material endgames with horrible pawns, to see that from far away, to have seen that, you know, even at this point would be pretty impressive. But to have gone into this series of tactics where he loses his rook um, and knowing that you could win this endgame here is just incredible. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you around on chess.com.